Meanwhile, in other health news, world leaders are trying to tackle drug-resistant superbugs. Several, in fact, are meeting today at the United Nations to discuss the health crisis. U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Matthews Burwell will address the group. Meanwhile, a new report says that deaths due to antibiotic resistance could increase globally from 700,000 to some 10 million per year by 2050. And here at home, there are some 2 million antibiotic resistant infections annually. 23,000 of those cases are deadly. And I'd like to welcome Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Matthews Burwell to discuss a, a whole lot, as much as we can possibly uh, get to here. Um, superbugs obviously have been a health threat for a long time, but this will be the first time now we see an international summit to discuss uh, the, the threat uh, collectively, globally, I guess, if you will. So what then do you hope to accomplish here? So today when I speak at the UN, and we're excited because it's only the fourth time that a health issue has been focused on in this way with all the countries together. And there are three main things in terms of focusing. One is what is the overprescribing of antibiotics mm -hmm. and the overtaking of antibiotics and the emphasis we need to place. And for all those who are out there, and I know I'm a mother of an and a six-year-old when you go in and you want solutions, but really understanding that there's a time and a place for that. So making sure we use them only when appropriate. Number two is making sure that we develop the tests so that healthcare uh, doctors, nurses, others can let you know, is this something appropriate for an antibiotic? And third, we need to make sure that we're investing in new antibiotics because right now, two million people a year in our country get an illness that is resistant. It is one of those bugs that is resistant and 23,000 of those folks are dying. Now obviously regulatory practices differ so uh, exponentially from country to country. I'm sure the average person believes well hey in the United States we're, we're on this so, so, so to speak but what impact can this have then globally? How how able will uh, those who perhaps are moved today by what they hear be able to then take this back to their country? So some of the European and fix countries. the problem. So some of the European countries are already focused on this tool, and we're seeing a reduction mm -hmm. in the use of antibiotics. And we believe we can do that here in the United States as well. But when we all do it together, that's when we're going to get the real reduction, and that's when we're all working together, going to find the new antibiotics and the new tests to let you know whether you need to use them or not. Right now, we're announcing twenty million dollars in a competition to try and help get the kinds of tests that we need to say do you need an antibiotic or do you not? Well, and I know you mentioned you have a couple of kids and it, sometimes it feels like the path of least resistance or the quickest route. I know I let my daughters roll around with the dogs as babies just to perhaps avoid it. But I mean, <laughs> the research shows as many, I was struck by this, 47 million prescriptions are handed out every year that are theoretically unnecessary. So really this seems yes. to be a problem for the medical community itself to solve if only by self-policing. Yes, but, and it's also the consumer and the patient uh, because it is also about the knowledge that you have that antibiotics aren't always the right solution and the overuse of antibiotics is causing a real problem. And when you think about some of these superbugs that our parents are getting at the other end of the spectrum as you're thinking about your children, making sure we're focused on really only using them when we can. So it's both about the providers and about all of us as consumers who want a quick solution or think that that is a quick solution. Obviously headlines then in this way uh, can probably serve to motivate if not yes. scare uh, consumers. Another uh, thing in the headlines then the Zika virus uh, has also uh, done this. Four new non-travel related Zika cases reported in Miami Beach just yesterday. Uh, I know we've spoken to any number of folks here on the program who uh, speak to the dire need for those billions of dollars to uh, to combat both what they're seeing right now on the front line and also to produce that vaccine. So where are we uh, with both and how important is that money that is still held up in Congress right now? You know, the money is very important and it's very important because Zika is something that is continuing to spread in our country. Yeah. Right now, we have had 19 babies in the United States, that's the 50 states and territories that have been born with microcephaly and tested positively for Zika. It's a real problem, a real issue. The money's needed for vaccines 
because that's one of the best ways we know to stop it. The money is needed so that we can move money to states, states like Florida, who are having challenges with mosquitoes that are actually spreading the virus. And third, the money is needed for the research so we understand, is it causing only microcephaly or is it causing other neurological damage? We're optimistic, cautiously, that the Congress will get this done before it leaves. Uh, you mentioned the 50 states, but I like to include Puerto, Puerto Rico, Rico. In, in this. It is uh, not just uh, obviously uh, connected to us. Uh, we're on the hook a as a nation. But also, it feels like not so much a front line as really a near future. How bad? How how how? potentially catastrophic is this there? It is an emergency situation in Puerto Rico. In the Puerto Rico, there are over 17,000 cases of Zika. And in the United States, the 50 states, yeah. there are another 3,000. Yeah. And in terms of the number of pregnant women who have tested positive for Zika, it's over 1,000. Now, in isn't Rico. that really an issue? People get a sense that, well, perhaps it wasn't so bad, but really the gestational lag of this disease, we won't see the real impact here until mm -hmm. March and April and May. Uh, then let me ask you about the vaccine as well. How far out are we? You know, in terms of the vaccine, uh, we are continuing to make progress. Progress, and it has been something that has moved forward on the track and trajectory that we hope. Even if we do do all the testing we need, uh, you know, we're a year to 18 months probably away, but you don't want to delay that by a day. And that's why getting the funding is essential. Uh, it's not often we have a Health and Human Services Secretary here, so I want to get you out of here on this one. With regard uh, to, to Mylan, uh, as the CEO gets set to testify before mm -hmm. Congress later today, um, there is another issue that has just come to light uh, that perhaps the company underpaid Medicaid for EpiPens, in, in essence, ripping off taxpayers. Two senators, Frank Pallone of New Jersey, Ron Wyden of Oregon, say they wrote you a letter uh, concerning this matter. Where does it stand and uh, what did you make of their uh, requests? So with regard to uh, when something is in the wrong pricing mm -hmm. category, that's what this is about, whether it should have been one category or another and what that means for the taxpayer as in Medicaid mm -hmm. and Medicare. And we have made clear on this and we make clear any time we believe that a drug is put into the wrong category uh, and we have made that clear to the company. Well, Secretary Burwell, uh, again, we uh, very much appreciate the time on uh, a very busy day for you. Uh, best of luck today. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. I appreciate it.